Great, thank you. So <clears throat> good morning and welcome everyone to this Integrated Monarch Monitoring Program um, introductory refresher workshop. Um, we're very excited that you could all join us this morning. My name is Kristen Nelson. I'm a science coordinator at the Monarch Joint Venture and I'm based in San Luis Obispo, California. Um, and Jen, did you just want to introduce yourself really quick, maybe? <laughs> sure thing. Th thanks, Kristen. I am Jennifer Thiem. I'm a science coordinator with MJV, and I am located in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Great. Thank you. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. We're really excited to have you all here this morning. Um, many of you may already be uh, familiar with the um, with the goals and the overall concepts of the Integrated Monarch Monitoring Program, the IMMP. Um, but the broad overarching goal of this program, just so we're all on the same page, is to monitor monarchs and to evaluate their habitats in order to inform conservation efforts. Um, more detail about the origin and the history of the monitoring program, as well as information about how the monitoring methods were selected are, um, are discussed in a pretty detailed um, but brief overview video that we have on our IMMP webpage, along with a lot of other resources. But our big picture goal is to gather consistent data about monarchs and their habitats across their entire um, U.S. range, which is mostly their breeding range. And the, the goal with that data collection is to better inform and also continuously update our conservation strategies. Um, and the cool thing about the IMMP with all of those goals in mind is that the data collected all goes into a single database, which then can be used and leveraged to inform updated research. So um, just starting out here with a little sneak peek and a snapshot at some of at some of the findings that um, that come out of that that have come out of the IMMP so far. Um, the IMMP has been around since about 2016, and a lot of research and papers have been generated from IMMP data in that um, in that time period. And a couple of those key sort of highlights are that we've had more than a thousand sites surveyed across 30 states, <clears throat> excuse me, and conservatively, more than 250 participants, not even including participants from this year's, um, from this year's start to the data collection season. And so <clears throat> just to kind of provide you some context and some information about what it looks like when we receive all this data and then start working with it, this is one specific example of IMMP data use in action. This was a project that is looking at a particular subset of data from the IMMP database, um, specifically focusing on data collected on conservation lands. So this project was looking at conservation sites located along the Eastern Flyway. And so that's basically from about Minnesota down to Texas. Um, and what we're looking at here um, is a little graph of their findings. And what they found is that there is significantly higher milkweed stem density on northern sites compared to southern sites. And again, that's just within this, this sort of subset of the IMMP data that they were looking at. Um, so just really quickly to orient you to this graph on the vertical axis or the y-axis, what we're showing is a log conversion of milkweed stem density. And the reason for that conversion, um, it just serves as a proxy for the actual count, the actual numbers of stem density that were documented. And that allows for a more accurate mathematical comparison of sites, um, partially because of the non-uniform distribution of milkweed on the landscape. And then on the x-axis, we're showing data basically um, lumped into one of two categories. So northern sites includes like Minnesota, Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan, and that region. And then southern sites would include um, the region around Texas, Kansas, Missouri. And so these gray boxes are basically showing us the range of the middle half 
of the data for each category. And then that solid black bar in the middle is showing the median value. And again, for this study, they found that there was statistically significant difference with more milkweed stem density occurring at northern sites compared to southern sites. Um, and then just for fun, zooming in to take a look at um, a finer scale comparison using the same type of data. Um, here's another graph showing a comparison of conservation sites that were monitored in and around the Chicago area compared to sites that were monitored around the Twin Cities area. So much finer scale. Um, and what we're looking at here is the same type of graph. And while there is, a de, uh, at least the way it's shown, a detectable difference in the milkweed stem density in these two categories, um, what we found here was that there was not a statistical difference. So no meaningful difference in the milkweed stem density for these two regions that were compared. Taking another look at a different type of analysis that was done, um, what we have found is that adult monarchs tend to be more abundant when blooming plants are more abundant, which is what we're looking at with this graph here. Um, on this y-axis, we're showing adult monarch density, and then the x-axis <clears throat> is showing blooming plant frequency with increasing from left to right. And while this relationship may seem really intuitive, it's important to be able to document data like this and in this format so that we can actually look for trends at various scales of interest, which then ultimately serves to inform conservation goals and how we spend our conservation dollars. And so um, in addition to what we're showing in the graph, in this data set, we were also able to determine the 22 specific nectar plants that monarchs were most frequently observed nectaring on, with purple coneflower and cup plant being the most frequently used. And so all that information is super valuable for being able to figure out how to best spend our time and energy on conservation efforts. And so these are just a few examples of how we can use IMMP data to answer different questions and at various scales, which is really fun and really cool. Um, and then it's also worth emphasizing that these examples I've just provided, these studies, are examples of data that were pulled from site uh, conservation sites. So those are sites that are um, receiving some kind of management, and they were sort of picked for monitoring specifically for that reason, because they're being managed. And that's really interesting and valuable. Um, but what we hope to be able to do as the IMMP data set continues to grow is to also be able to see how these data and these types of trend will differ or compare on randomly selected, site, uh, selected sites that are distributed um, more evenly and randomly across the greater landscape. And so that brings me to, um, to this which is a little discussion, a brief intro into the, um, the options for site selection when you're conducting IMMP monitoring. There's two different uh, sort of categories of sites that you might select if you're gonna do some monitoring. Um, and one of the key components, which I've just alluded to of the IMMP is the ability to gather data from sites that are truly random and when, they, when I say that, I mean that they're selected without any bias or, um, or reason for like, you know that there are certain plants there or you know that there's a lot of monarch activity there because that would indicate some, some bias, some reason that you're selecting that site to monitor. Um, and instead, the truly randomly selected sites are predetermined and they paint this picture or they are representative of the entire landscape. Um, and so these sites were randomly selected as part of the establishment of the IMMP monitoring protocol. So like I said, they're predetermined. They're also spatially balanced across the entire monarch breeding range um, in the United States. And this allows for the inclusion of areas that may otherwise be overlooked for monitoring, such as ag fields or, you know, adjacent sort of 
wastelands, if you will, areas that are difficult to access or even roadsides um, and so on. And that's important in painting a really complete picture of what habitat is available to monarchs out on the landscape. So um, it's important to understand what's going on at these randomly selected sites, but all of that said, there is still a lot of value in data that is selected uh, or that is collected from sites um, that you may be specifically interested in as a land manager or um, as a even a, just a private land owner um, at sites that are like a park or a garden or even a restoration plot. And so these are the two categories, if you will, of site, site options that you have in monitoring for the IMMP. You, either random sites or randomly selected sites or self-selected sites, which generally, again, are picked with some sort of bias or knowledge of that site. Um, the other thing that I was going to note about self-selected sites is that it also bolsters, um, you know, there's value in collecting data on these types of sites because it helps us understand how um, land uses are changing over time and how the habitat on those managed lands are changing over time, which is really important. And it also bolsters our data about the abundance of monarch reproduction and use. Um, because as I've been saying, self-selected sites are often biased towards sites that have more monarch activity. So it still gives us this really um, important piece of the puzzle. And so with regard to these two monitoring site types, the random and the self-selected, we do have some brief pre-recorded training videos that walk you through each step of how to pick out and name your site with a unique identifier using a standard method. Um, these videos are each about nine to 10 minutes long. Um, so they're pretty brief. And going into it, if you're trying to pick which videos are most relevant for you, if you already have a site in mind that you know that you want to monitor, that's most likely you're almost surely going to be a self-selected site. So you could focus on that training video um, or you could watch them both just to get the full understanding of the different site types and how they're different. Um, and in a few minutes, we're going to walk you through a live practice example um, for how to go through that process of choosing and naming and registering a self-selected site specifically is what we're gonna focus on today. And <clears throat> excuse me, before we do that, I wanna take a quick look and share with you the overall structure of the IMMP. Again, some of you may be more or less familiar with this, um, but the IMMP includes several different activities and you don't have to complete all of them. There, excuse me, there are two required activities, the site description and the conservation management history. The site description will be completed every single time that you monitor your site. And it gives us that basic information about where your site is located, um, landscape characteristics, and just some good basic information. And this activity only takes about 15 minutes and it's really important because it allows us to track how, um, how your site changes over time through the seasons and from year to year. And then the conservation management history is completed only annually. And it applies to sites that are being managed for conservation, which is fairly common uh, uh, reasoning for self-selected sites being monitored. So it's often very applicable. And so these are the two basic required activities that you would complete when doing IMMP monitoring. And then after that, you get some options. So there's four optional activities in the IMMP. And there, again, I'll just keep referencing it. There's training videos that are specific to each one. So you can um, sort of figure out which ones are gonna be applicable and then focus on those more detailed training videos that are on the IMMP webpage. Um, activity one, I'm just gonna go over each of them here briefly. Activity one is the milkweed and blooming plant survey. So depending on the size and vegetative diversity of the site that you're monitoring, this takes uh, anywhere from one to four hours. 
Um, activity two is the monarch egg and larva survey. And what this includes is basically inspecting uh, your milkweed that you have on your site for eggs and larvae. And again, depending on how much milkweed you have, this takes about one to two hours. Um, that said, if you don't have any milkweed on your site, you would not need to complete this activity. Activity three is the adult monarch survey. This takes about 30 minutes and it entails basically walking around the perimeter of your plot and recording adult monarchs and their activity or their behavior. And then the last activity is an optional one to rear monarchs and document parasitism and survival rates. So this would require um, brief daily monitoring and also just a little bit of um, care and best management practices for rearing. Um, and the cool part about this is the data is shared. We work in collaboration with Project Monarch Health, as well as the Monarch Larval Monitoring Project to share this data to report about parasites um, and survival rates. Um, a quick additional note about activity four, um, if you're based in California like I am, rearing or handling of any life stage of monarchs, so in any capacity, handling or possessing monarchs is not currently permitted at all in the state of California. So activity four would not be uh, an option for uh, folks currently residing in California. And so again, the website has a lot of detailed info about completing each of these activities, including guidance on how frequently each activity should be completed. Um, and I'll just mention that briefly. Activity one, our recommendation is uh, basically to repeat that activity monthly if you're doing it. Activity two, the recommended frequency is weekly. And that, of course, is because you're tracking eggs and larvae. And so you want to sort of be able to track through time how they're progressing um, and surviving. Activity three is recommended to occur biweekly. And um, these, are, these are recommendations that are built into the protocol. But it's also worth noting that it is OK to complete these activities at any frequency that is feasible to you. So um, our recommendations are sort of the ideal frequency, but in order, to, in order to capture information about how vegetation and monarch use at a site is changing through the seasons, but if you're only able to get out a couple times in a season or once, that's okay too. And that, again, that data is still very valuable. And then the last component of conducting the IMMP that is worth noting is data entry. So um, currently our IMMP monitors use paper data sheets and all of those data sheets are, they're, um, they're uh, formatted and ready to go for you on the website. So you can just grab them, download them and print them. And then you're responsible for entering your own data into our online data portal system. And uh, you're gonna get a little preview of that today too in our live uh, practice example. So I just wanna provide a brief overview um, before we dive into our, our practice part of the session, an overview of the types of outputs that we get from IMMP data. Again, just to provide some nice context. Um, so one big piece, of data that we get is about species richness of blooming plants. And this is actually a really cool and exciting piece of the data that is rarely studied, especially in monarch focused programs, which tend to just be focused more on the actual, uh, the monarch and the life stages and reproduction. Um, so this habitat piece, understanding and documenting the blooming plants is really, it's a really cool and, and important piece of the puzzle. We also gather data about um, the frequency and timing of blooming species, as well as milkweed stem density. And uh, of course, this is milkweed stem density is really critical to our state and national conservation goals because it's a priority to understand how much milkweed is on the landscape and where it is. Again, tying back into that overarching goal of informing conservation efforts. Um, we don't know where to put our time and money 
if we don't know where um, the habitat is most needed or what specific activities are most needed. So that's a really important piece of the puzzle. Um, and then of course we get data about the presence and timing of monarch reproduction, egg and larval density, and also larval survival. And then we get, of course, the, um, the management outcomes. So what management is related to or affecting the data you're collecting and how is it contributing to changes in the data over time? Um, and this can feed right back into informing adaptive management strategies for the land that you are managing. So I wanna switch gears briefly. I know I'm just uh, hitting you with a whole bunch of information, but I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about site selection, site description, and registration before jumping into a little practice with, uh, with Jen. So the first thing you're going to need to do when you decide you're going to do IMMP monitoring is, um, or one of the first things that you're going to need to do rather, is to select your plot shape. Um, and I want to provide uh, an overview of the process and options. So there are a couple different plot shapes that you might use depending on your the specifics of your site. Um, I also want to note that uh, as I talk about these, MMP typically occurs on sites that are greater than one acre. Um, and that allows you as the monitor to use a standard plot size and also get more detailed vegetation data if, if that site that you're monitoring is at least an acre in size. But it's um, also possible, and we're gonna talk about how to go about monitoring a smaller site. So diving in here, the first plot shape is what we call a standard rectangle. It's 50 meters by 200 meters. And it can be oriented on your site in a north and south direction or rotated as needed to avoid barriers. So if you've got a property line or a road or some significant change in the habitat from like open grassland to a forest edge, then you would want to rotate this plot shape. And if you cannot fit a 200 meter long rectangle on your site in any orientation, then you might use what we call a standard square. And this plot is 100 meters by 100 meters and just allows, it's a little bit more compact. So if you don't have a really long site or space for the standard rectangle. The third plot type is called irregular. And it's typically, you know, sort, sort of self-descriptive here. It's typically used at sites that have an unusual shape. Maybe it's an opening, um, it, surrounded by forests or woodland and, and you want to focus on the weirdly shaped opening of grassland and wildflower habitat. You can also use the next plot type, which uh, we call linear. This is fairly commonly used to specifically along rights of way. So if you're surveying along a, a road edge or a utility line, you might use a linear plot, which is 500 meters long and the width of your right-of-way, whatever that may be. And then the last option is specific for small sites, very small sites, which is what we call a census. Um, and this plot type basically includes the entirety of a small site. So if you've just got a zone, a restoration plot, or something that you're focusing on and it's very small, you would use a census plot. And so once you've determined your appropriate plot shape, you need to assign it a unique identifier, which is based on a standard method that I'm gonna just sort of walk you through right now. So at the top of this slide here is an example of uh, the structure for a plot ID. And every plot ID has three parts to it. And the first part, um, which in this example is a, uh, AGC. This first part is a code that indicates land use type. And these are predetermined categories that I'll talk a little bit more about in a second. Um, the second part is always a six digit numeric code that corresponds to the monarch block that your plot is in. 
And this is information that you will get from our IMMP map portal. So you don't have to make that up. That's something that you'll grab um, from our website. And then the third part is also six characters long and in a random plot type, it'll be strictly numeric, but in a self-selected site as the example here and as we're gonna focus on in our live example today would be alphanumeric. And so um, breaking this down into its component parts, um, that's how that looks. It's land use, monarch block, and then sort of six unique identifiers. And here are some examples of the, um, the most common land use categories that are used. Um, there's a table in our guidebook that helps you select from, again, it's a predetermined list of land use categories. Um, and there's a table in our guidebook that will help you select which one. Uh, but just by way of example, these are some of the most common ones. PGS stands for protected grassland. And this would include things like uh, public park or public land. UGS is an unclassified grassland, and this would include things like monitoring um, on or near your backyard, some private, some private residence, or maybe a restoration, a small restoration plot. AGC stands for Ag Conservation Land, and this includes agricultural land that is specifically enrolled in some type of conservation program. And then ROW, of course, stands for rights of way. And this would be things like uh, in public rights of way along roads or utility lines. And there are a few more categories, but these are some of the, the top most common ones. Um, and I want to add just one additional note about the grassland categories. PGS and UGS are um, not necessarily intended to reflect the specific character of the vegetation type on your plot so much as it is intended to um, indicate the protection status of the land. And so maybe more applicable in the West, and I don't know how many folks here are, are located in the West, but you may be monitoring areas that include some shrubs with grassland flowers in between, or maybe like a desert-like shrubby grassland. And when you're looking at that landscape, you might not be thinking in your head like, this is a grassland, but those areas would fall into most likely the PGS or UGS category with the idea being that it has, it indicates the protection status. So it's protected or it's just unclassified, like again, like your private, um, private residence or private property or something like that for the unclassified. Hopefully that clarified it and didn't confuse it. And then the monarch block, I sort of mentioned this already. This is the second component of your site ID. And this, um, this is predetermined and it's based on a grid that was mapped over the entire US as part of establishing this monitoring protocol. And we're gonna show you in a few minutes um, what it looks like on the website. There's a map of the United States and as you zoom in far enough, you can start to see that grid layer show up and then each block or each cell within that grid has a pre-assigned number to it. And so the key with this is that you always want this second part of the site ID to be six numbers long. And just referencing our example here, the Monarch block number was 73655, which is only five digits long. So we added a leading zero to ensure that it's six. And you might need to add one, two, three, four leading zeros, depending on your monarch block, in order to make sure that's six numbers long. And then for the last piece, again, we're focusing on self-selected sites here with our example. Um, this is also a six digit figure, and it's gonna be a combination of letters and numbers for self-selected sites. And so it's gonna start always with SS, meaning self-selected, and then that's gonna be followed by three letters that are determined by you. And so that might be your initials or an abbreviation of the park name that you're monitoring in. Um, it's, it's up to you really. And so that's SS. And then in this example, we put MJV. And then that last number is just going to be a logical number indicating Here's that bullet for that, sorry about that. Um, indicating in chronological order 
which uh, self-selected site this is within a given monarch block. So if it's the first self-selected site that's being monitored by you in this particular block, it would be a one. If it's the second one that you've chosen within the same monarch block, and again, that monarch block is um, grabbed from the map portal, then you would put a two or a three and so on. And so uh, I think that covers it for the, for the plot ID. Again, it's relatively straightforward and it just sometimes takes a little practice. Um, and at this point, I don't know, I'm not watching the chat or if any questions came in with this big info dump up front, but I'm gonna pass it off to Jennifer to jump into our live example. Um, and as questions come up, feel free to drop them in the, in the chat box and I, and I can help monitor that. And Thanks a bunch, Kristen. Yeah, I will. Yeah. <laughs> we answered a few questions in the chat at this point, Great. and I'm sure they'll they'll keep rolling in. So thanks for keeping an eye on that. Great. And I'll stop sharing so that you can take over and have controls of your slide. All right, here it comes. Okay. So I've got this slide here where Kristen left off. So thanks for that uh, great walkthrough of how we name our plots. And you do this just once. So you're going to have the same plot ID year after year. Um, so once you figure this out, you are all set. Um, I'm going to advance here, let's see, to uh, a web link. And I'm also going to drop this link into our chat. Um, you know, my chat always disappears when I share. Here it comes. If you have another screen or another tab and you're able to follow along, I recommend doing that. Um, otherwise, you can just watch my screen and we're going to walk through an example of picking out all this plot ID information for a self-selected site. We're focusing on a self-selected site today. Like Kristen said, a lot of our people who are involved in the IMMP um, choose a site that they want to monitor. They're already invested in it for some reason or other. Um, but then there are the training videos, as she showed, for selecting a random site. And we love when people monitor random sites. It's great information. You follow a slightly different, um, you go to a different website and follow a slightly different uh, path to get that name. Um, so those training videos will walk you through that. So here we have um, our little self-select site map link. It'll take you to this map um, with a bunch of red dots on it. And so these are red dots where people have registered their own personal sites that they're monitoring. You are not required to enter it onto this map. This map is a tool so that you can get the right plot ID but you are welcome to enter your own um, personal plot on here. It's really neat to see the expanse of everybody's self-selected sites. So um, I encourage you to zoom in on this map. You can use like a little scrolling um, scroller on your mouse or in, on my screen, the arrows will show up on the left. Your screen might have a slightly different display, but you can zoom in and out um, with the arrows. And zoom in to a place that you think you might want it to monitor if you already have something in mind. I'm gonna zoom into our example uh, preserve around Swanson, Ohio here. Um, there is a nature preserve called the Kitty Todd Nature Preserve. Um, great place for birding and conservation. So if you can get there, go check it out. Um, but you'll see, first of all, as you zoom in, this green grid appears over the map. So um, these are the monarch blocks that Kristen was talking about. Uh, pretty self-explanatory once you actually see it on the map like this. Your location is going to fall within one of those squares. And then the numbers right in the middle of the square, that's the monarch block ID. So we're zooming in <clears throat> and this preserve falls across two different plots or two different monarch blocks. So if we monitored something over here on the left, we'd be in one monarch block. If we monitored a plot over on the, the right of the screen line, we'd be in a different monarch block. Um, we're gonna focus here on the right on this kind of open area here. So that's, let's say an area we want to monitor because we're gonna do some restoration there and we wanna start tracking. Um, the first part of our plot ID is that three letter code for the land use type. 
um, Kristen said there's a table in our guidebook that shows all the codes. You might be able to pick this out real easy off the top of your head if you're working on a, on a park like this. It's probably the PGS, Protected Grassland. So our, um, our plot ID is going to start with PGS in this example. Then we need that monarch block ID. So I'm going to see what was our number here. This block was 61455. It does not meet our uh, six figure limit. So we're going to have to add a leading zero. So when we write this out or when we register it in our system, it's 061455. So far we have PGS. 061455. Then those last um, six figures or digits, um, there's little flexibility there. So it usually starts with SS to indicate self selected. And then we like to have three letters. Oftentimes it's your initials. Um, we Our example was MJV for Monarch Joint Venture. Um, it might be the three first letters of your park name. So in this example, I'm going to go with S-S-K-I-T for Kitty Todd Nature Preserve, and then the number one, because it's our first one. So I'm going to type that in the chat, um, what we had here, 061455, S-S-K-I-T, one. And if we were going to monitor multiple plots in this area, in this block, we'd have S-S-K-I-T, two, K-I-T, three, and so on. Are there any um, questions on how we got that plot ID? And as you're zooming in um, on your own site, if you can enter your plot ID in the chat, that'd be interesting to see where how people are coming up with their, their plot ID. So feel free if you've, through this practice, found your own plot ID, go ahead and type it in the chat. Awesome. So some people are getting there. So this is wonderful. And if you have any questions or issues, um, feel free to watch those training videos. And you can always email us at monitoring at monarchjointventure.org and we'll respond to you. So now I'm going to switch back over to our presentation and talk briefly about this site description form. So Kristen emphasized it. This is uh, the one form that you have to fill out every time you go to your site. Um, like she said, it gets some basic information so we can track on a very basic level, even if you're not choosing to do the, the big in-depth vegetation survey, we still get a little bit of information about your um, what's surrounding land use is around your plot. We get a little bit of information about what's growing there. Um, what's the percent cover of just trees and grasses. It is a really shrubby site. So that'll take you about 15 minutes the first time and, and it'll take you less time after that because you'll be familiar with your site. Um, and the, the, one of some of the parts, you only fill out the first visit. So you can see on the slide here, um, always on the top, you wanna fill out your survey date, your plot ID, your name. And then if this is a follow-up visit, so you're up um, visiting it the second or third time, just skip right to the back page. And the back page is that really broad um, vegetation info. Um, then, then we have, so this is an example of how we would fill it out with our, with our um, Kitty Todd preserve example. Um, so at the top, you'd see we've got our PGS for our site type code. That's what we call it, this land use code. Our Monarch block ID 061455, and then SSKIT1 is our sampling point. You fill in your plot coordinates. You can also get the coordinates from the map. So I'm gonna switch back over real quick and show you um, that also walks through this in the, the training video. But as I move my mouse, Look in the bottom left um, of my screen, and you'll see these numbers. These are that. These are your coordinates, and they're moving as I move my mouse. If I want to figure out exactly 
what the coordinates for maybe my starting point are. There's a little crosshairs icon right next to my coordinates. <clears throat> I'm going to click on that. And now it tells me to click on the map to get the coordinates. So I'm just going to click in our imaginary plot here. Um, maybe that's our starting point. And now you'll see that the numbers on my bottom left screen, they're stable. They're showing me where that little green pinpoint is. That's how you can get your coordinates from this map. One thing I want to highlight is that once you set up your plot and you start collecting data from it, don't move your plot. It's very, very important that you are consistently monitoring the same space. Um, some people think that they have to maybe follow the milkweed because sometimes milkweed uh, shifts a little bit, or maybe they just didn't like for some reason an area, they, maybe they changed how they were going to manage it. Um, there are all kinds of reasons people think they need to move their plots but it's very important to keep monitoring the same space. So let's look at an example of 2018. I had a plot in this yellow location. I collected data, told you what the vegetation is like. In 2019, my milkweed shifted a little bit. I just decided I moved my plot. I gathered information from a different area. And so it's really not comparable to the year before. I can't tell if the changes that I'm seeing are because I moved my plot or because something happened on the site. So we move it again the following year, maybe it got too shady or overgrown. So don't move your plot after you start collecting data. We can talk through options. If you don't like where you're monitoring, we can set you up with a new entirely different plot that doesn't overlap an area where you've surveyed. Um, or we can, we can walk through some other um, instances depending on your situation. But just, I wanna throw that out there. Don't, don't shift your plot around. We do need consistent information from a same space. So we've gone through that site selection process and how to name your site. Um, here's an opportunity to throw your uh, questions in the chat or feel free to pull yourself off mute and ask us if you've got questions. Will there be a sheet that shows like the different like codes, like the three letter codes for naming the sites, like the agricultural one and like something like that to like reference? Yes, there is. Um, the IMMP guidebook and will include a link in our follow up email. The okay. guidebook is available on our website and that has a table that shows you all the codes and defines what they all are. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not necessarily seeing when you when you register the site in the data portal where you put that code in. It, it asks for the uh, the block number mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. the ID, but how do you get the three letter code? That's technically entered on your site description. Okay. So yeah, Liz is ahead of the game here, and we'll practice in a minute registering our site in the portal when we register it it won't actually access for that um, three letter code. Instead, we're gonna enter it on our site description form the first time we go out there. Oh, good. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah, and we do that actually because it can, it technically could change. Maybe you're uh, newly enrolled in an agricultural conservation uh, plan. So the, the, site, the site description form will track it over time if it does change. However, the, the permanent code that you use is what you've designed it the very first year. What types of changes are you looking for in the data when monitoring a plot from year to year? Um, that, that's a great question. There are all kinds of things that we can look at and have looked at. So we might be looking for um, how milkweed stem density, density, stem density changes throughout time or relate that back to management activity. Maybe we're seeing um, an, a, a change in milkweed stem density after a prescribed fire. We can look at all of this information at different scales as well. Some of our organizations are interested in their particular site to see what's going on year after year after year for management. Um, at larger scales, we might be able to see if there are trends, maybe an overall decrease in um, nectar resource availability. Maybe we're finding less and less um, uh, nectar plants available in our surveys. We can also track 
um, phenology. Maybe certain species of nectar plants are blooming earlier and earlier, and earlier in the spring. So over time, the, the longer amount of time we survey and the more sites we have, the more questions we can answer. Hi, hey Jennifer. A question, I was trying to follow along live on the map to find my site. Mm -hmm. And when I clicked on my site, I got the ID that I initially typed in chat with the DEV. And then okay. I went back through the email you sent me on what my site is called and it was POS. What is the difference? It was the, the PGS maybe? No, when I, when I typed on, when I went to the map live and hit on my, the dot for my site, mm. it says plot ID is DEV. And then what you sent me is POS. Um, P P O S wouldn't, that would be incorrect. Okay. Um, it, it might've been P G S. Oh, P G S maybe. That's yeah. Right. For the protected grassland. Oh, um, okay. Which so, is because it is a, a protected grassland. And so that was something that we maybe found out after, after we saw the site or verified that, oh my gosh, this is actually a, a protected grassland. And so that's, that's correct that it is protected grassland because so you are monitoring that, that park, right? If I go to that dot, shouldn't it say PGS? What is the DEV? I'm just curious. The DEV is an automatically generated um, assignment for developed area. Okay. So though at um, that that is for kind of the small urban parks or small um, as kind of urban areas, developed areas. And it looks like when you were first assigned yours, it, it either was or used to be a PGS or it was verified as a PGS. Um, so continue forward with the PGS that has PGS. been assigned. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, thanks, Donna. Um, I'm going to throw our uh, presentation back up here and move on to our next slides. I have a, a quiz with just a couple questions here. Um, uh, how often do you conduct the site description? Feel free to throw that answer in the chat. Okay, time, every time. All right. A lot of every time, every visit. Yeah, the site description is that one sheet that you're um, filling out every time. So one answer for annually, the conservation management form is the one that's filled out annually. Just a quick summary of what management occurred on site. <clears throat> when is it appropriate to move your IMMP plot? Never. Okay, good. The messages across. Um, technically, if you haven't, yeah, if you haven't collected data on it um, yet, you could move it. But once you start collecting data there, don't move it. Great. So now we're going to practice registering our example site in the IMMP portal. So I'm going to drop our portal link into the chat and as well as this login information. You're welcome to follow along on your own computer or just watch the screen here. If you click that link in the chat, it's going to take you to our portal. And then the name you're going to use is IMMP Tester. And the password is 2022 IMMP Workshop. I'm going to switch over to our portal live here and enter that information. You are welcome to play around in this test account till your heart's content. Enter all the fake data you want, practice entering um, practice sites. Know that this will be deleted, so don't put real information in here. Um, but it'll be live through the end of May, just so people can continue practicing. 
So here we are, we're logged into the portal. We have this helpful yellow banner on top. Um, choose a site that kind of walks you through what we already talked about. You know, watch these training videos. Do you want self-selected or random site? Um, that's just a little refresher. We want to register our site. So you click on that gold tab, register a site. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that self-selected and random stuff. At the bottom, I'm going to say, hey, yeah, I want to register a new site. Click our little green icon. And because self-selected or random is very important for us to track, it asks you about that right up front. OK, we self-selected a site. So I'm going to tell, tell the system it's self-selected. And our block number. Our block number is 0, 1, 0, 6, 1, 4, 5, 5. Our point ID, K -I -T -S -S -K -I -T. I've already registered this a bunch of times, so I'm going to have to go with 4. Um, but you put your point idea here. Our state was Ohio. Easy little drop down boxes here. Then once I pick my state, it's going to ask for our county. If you want to name your site, you can. Um, that would be the name that shows up when you enter data. Otherwise, it'll just give you this plot ID, the block number and your point ID. So I'm going to say, Kitty test site. Do you own or manage this land? Um, this is where we have the, for now we're gonna say yes, maybe this is my backyard or I'm a staff member at the Kitty Tide Nature Preserve. So I can say yes, I own and manage this land. We will do an example without. Once I hit submit, if everything passes the, uh, the test here, it'll click you over to this site where you can either you know, say your site was successfully registered, we can register another one or start entering data. Give us a holler if that didn't make sense or, or you wanna run through it again. Okay. So when we got to that point where it asks us, do you own or manage this site? Um, a lot of times people don't own or manage the site. I'm at a random site. I had to knock on this person's door. I got permission to monitor it. What I need to do is actually document that I have permission to monitor it. Or maybe I'm uh, volunteering at a park. So sometimes the park departments have their own permissions or permits and, and you're cool there if you already have a permit through your park. But if you don't, or if you're working with a private landowner, um, they should sign a data sharing and access release. So we have a couple versions of this on our website. We'll send the links to you, um, but you can, they're PDFs, they're fillable PDFs, or people can print them out. And it basically says, um, it gives you permission to be on that land and it asks them how they wanna share their data. Because this, the IMMP data are available to researchers, but, the landowner could choose to mask their data if they want. So let's say, I don't want somebody to know that you found this rare species here. Um, so I will mask my data to uh, the block level or mask it to the county. The landowner or the land manager would get to choose that. So back to our um, site registration example. Let's register another site just real quickly and pretend that we had to get this form signed from uh, the actual landowner. Site type, all right, it was a self-selected one. We've got our same block number, a different KIT5, different point ID. We're still in Ohio, in Lucas County. Our site name is oh, not mine. So no, I don't own or manage this land. <coughs> then a couple other questions pop up. Do I have permission? Yes, you should always have permission if you're going this far through date. So when they're signing that um, that waiver, you or they can put whatever date you want on it. So if you want to suggest they you know sign this out for two years and they're comfortable with that, great. If they just want to do it for the season or the month, um, 
that's fine too. So just put the permission end date. So I'm gonna go through the end of May next year. Yes, they signed that paper form. We also have an electronic or a digital form online. Um, so that link will be provided to you. Um, that's where you just sign all the same stuff. It's just automatically online. It shoots them an email and then they sign it online. So we got a paper form. They signed a hard copy. You're asked to upload it. So you pick your file. And there we go. We uploaded our picture of this, this form. Landowner information. You only have to fill out anything with an asterisk next to it. So we just want to know our landowner name. If there's a different contact person, you're welcome to add more information. But really, all we just need is a landowner name. Submit. And we should have yet another site registered. Um, I see a concern about the JOT form version. That's the digital online signed version. The land manager said it never arrived. That's a, hmm. um, yeah, we've I've had one experience where it it was either filtered out or um, went to their junk box or something. Um, that's that's the only thought I have right now. It it has worked successfully for most people. Um, so if I if we hear more or have other thoughts, I, I appreciate you bringing that up, but it didn't seem to work for that one instance. Yeah, yeah. I'll just just add. It's always worth checking with someone if if you think they should be receiving something, especially an auto generated email or even my work email with the long handle of Monarch Joint Venture. I find that government entities junk filters are strong enough that I get filtered with people's junk mail regularly. And so it's just always something to keep in the back of your mind with cybersecurity, junk filters and spam filters are getting stronger and sometimes filtering out stuff that you want. So that's my only thought. All right, a quick little look at that conservation management history form. This is the one that's filled out annually. So it's pretty self-explanatory. It's just a sheet with a lot of potential management options on it. So at the top, you're filling out your plot ID, the date, this doesn't matter when you fill it out. You have one a year, um, the year that the conservation management started. And then this becomes additive in, your, in the IMMP portal. So you'll say it started in 2020, maybe that was our initial year, it used to be um, agriculture, corn and soy, and then boom, check all the stuff that happened this year. Oh, well, we planted some plugs, we uh, did a little prescribed fire and did some herbaceous removal on some noxious weeds. And that becomes additive. So next year, you if you did one management activity, you just enter that one management activity, and that's it. Now we've gotten into our optional activities. So this is not, just to stress, this is not a detailed training of how to conduct each activity. This is just to help you choose which ones you wanna do. Um, we have training videos online that you can dive into for anything that you want to do, and we'll send those in the follow-up email. Um, our activity one, we call it, the Milkweed and Blooming Plant Survey, as Kristen said, can take one to four hours. The first time you do this, it's probably going to take something on the longer end. It just takes a minute to you know, get used to the process. You start this um, activity, or you can start it, as soon as milkweed emerges or as soon as monarchs may be in your area. Um, so now is the time probably for anybody and everybody on this call. Um, you're, in, you're in good territory for um, doing this activity. And then end it with when monarchs leave. Just a note on that is that that actually gives people in the South an, a lull period, if you, for lack of a better term. But uh, when monarchs will migrate through the Southern US and then they'll kind of, for the most part, be absent from that region for a, a month or two and then they'll come back down. So um, if you're in the Southern US and there's a period at which monarchs are not in, present in your area, no need to survey. We recommend doing this monthly but do it you know, as, as frequently as works for you. 
There are three parts to the milkweed and blooming plant survey. There's a milkweed stem count. There's a blooming plant frequency. So you're gonna be identifying um, nectar plants and telling us a little bit about, uh, about where you're finding them. And then uh, a meander plant list. So that's kind of a, a walk, a zigzag through your plot to, to list any species that you didn't find on your blooming plant survey. So activity one um, has a lot of walking involved. So if you, um, if you have this standard rectangle shape, so here we are zoomed in at our Kitty, Top, Kitty Todd Preserve plot. Um, you'd have your starting point. So let's say we started at this southwest corner of our plot. You would sample all along the one edge, then walk over and sample or record information all the way down the middle. So we call these transects. You're sampling up one transect, sample down another transect, and then scoot over to the other long side and sample halfway up it. That gets you 100 subplots. Um, I won't go into detail, but that's how many subplots we want to sample. That's the length of transects we want to sample. So this is the path that you would follow if you have a rectangular plot. There's a lot of walking, just a heads up that if, if this is your site size and you're doing activity one, um, it's nearly half a mile of walking. So um, you'll get your exercise. It's fun. You'll see so much stuff, uh, but just be prepared to you know, have water and sunscreen and hat and all that. Um, don't survey between these transects. So you're only going to survey along the black dotted line, walk over to start a new transect, and then survey along that black dotted line. Uh, we have had people start surveying along the, like as they walk between the transect, but that's not appropriate. That's not how the the sampling protocol is. So just to be aware of that, you're just walking from transect to transect, and then you start surveying again. <clears throat> Couple little tips. Um, it's helpful to have two people. If you can bring a partner, it's great. Makes it um, a little faster, more fun. Someone can be looking up plants that you have a question on while someone else is recording data. Mark your corners. You might want to start by marking the corners of your plot, if it's a square or a rectangle. Um, or we've had people who actually mark the start and end of each transect, which is helpful as you're you know, rolling out maybe a transect tape or a measuring rope. Um, <coughs> you can just walk from flag down at the south side, walk directly to your flag up on the north side without pulling out your compass all the time. Irregular plots might be less than 100 subplots. So watch our training video. Um, it'll walk you through that. But if you don't hit exactly 100 subplots in a strangely shaped plot, that's OK. You'll probably get up to 80 or 90. And you're following the protocol. That's fine. How far apart are the transects? That's actually variable. So watch our training videos. It's anywhere between 7 and 25 meters apart. Um, just a note that there are two ways that you can count milkweed, if you choose to count milkweed. Um, this is an option on, on the protocol. Um, along your transect, you're putting down these sampling frames. So you'll have this PVC pipe, usually uh, rectangular, that you're putting down. You're recording some information in it. If you have a lot of milkweed on your site, you're going to find some milkweed. You're going to count it in these little red spaces. You can find it and count it in your... Um, subplots. But some areas, particularly out west, uh, maybe where Kristen is, you don't have that much milkweed at all. And you might not get any or, or maybe one or two plants within these sampling subplots. Uh, but we still want to be able to get to calculate a milkweed stem density. And if you're skipping, oh, we're skipping this one because it's not in a subplot, and you're skipping this one because it's not in a subplot, we're actually not able to calculate a stem density. So if you have a really sparse milkweed, there's an option to count all the milkweed within one meter of your transect. So only do that if you have real sparse milkweed. Watch our training video. It shows you that. It's got a little checkbox on the data sheet 
to tell us, yeah, I looked at the whole belt instead of just the sub-levels. And also just a little FYI to only record the plants that are rooted within your subplot. So in this example, we've got a daisy um, hanging over into our subplot. We wouldn't count that even though the flower itself is in there, we wanna know what's rooted in the subplot. And the training videos walk you through those practice examples. We've got um, FAQs on our website. We'll send a link to that. Um, and hopefully that'll address any other questions. Um, just wanna also point out that there are two options for recording nectar plants. If you're comfortable IDing plants to species um, or, or most plants to species, then record them to species, we call that level A. Um, you can also record them to genus if, if you're unsure, but you get it real close. Um, or even family, I think you can actually enter into our system. But if you know right off the bat that like you're terrible with plant ID, I don't wanna spend my time looking at a bunch of uh, floral wildflower books, um, you can choose what we call level B. You don't have to ID the plant species. You just basically are marking the presence of a flower in your subplot. So you've got options there, more options. You don't have to do the blooming plant frequency component at all if you don't want to. Um, that's a new change as of this year, uh, but we have had a lot of partners who are just just interested in the milkweed stem density. They know they have milkweed stem density goals. They don't want to take the effort or they're not tracking um, the nectar plants. And so you can choose not to do the ne nectar plant survey at all. Um, same with the milkweed stem count. Maybe someone who's not interested in monarch habitat is doing this. They do care about the nectar plants, but maybe they're less interested in the stem count. Um, then they can skip the stem count. Then a quick nod to our census sites. So uh, some people are interested in a really small site. I just replanted my, I don't know, a couple square meters of a new uh, urban prairie garden. And that you can monitor too, we call it a census site. Um, so the yellow, the, well, the white outline might be the area you planted. And then the, the yellow is basically the same outline. That's your plot outline. <clears throat> the census survey has a different data sheet. You're collecting slightly less information there. We still want a stem count and we still want a meander plant list. So you walk through your little site, you count your milkweed stems, you ID your milkweed species, you make a list of all the species that are in bloom, but you're not going to have transects. You're not going to put down these sampling frames. Your site is just a little too small for that. So this whole booming plant frequency component, it's not on our census data sheets. Um, the meander plant list and the milkweed stem counts are both optional. So on your census site, if you only care about milkweed stem, stem counts, you just do that part. One little heads up, little alert about data entry and plant names. Uh, not everybody uses the same common name. So our drop-down list for our plants originated from the USDA plants database, which is an official source of uh, plant uh, common names and, and scientific names. You can look up your plant, you can enter it using either one, but just be aware that you might type in a common name and it doesn't show up. Um, that doesn't mean that it, it's not in our system, it just means that maybe it has a weird name. <laughs> weird common name in the plants database. So one of the examples here is this plant that we often see in the Midwest that might be familiar. Anybody in the chat um, haven't, what do you call this one? What common name might this plant be? Type in, I call the rattlesnake master is what I've learned it and what I think everybody I've met calls it. Um, that's not what the USDA plants database calls it. They call it button arigno. 
So if I type in Rattlesnake Master, it's not going to pop up. Um, so if, if you're typing in something, you're like, I can't believe this plant is not in your system. Just check this USDA plants database, see if you've got the right name or try the, the scientific name instead. And then if, if for some reason you're confident that um, you have a plant that's not in the dropdown list, which, which does happen, um, you can put other. So just select other and then you'll type in what it is. And that's okay. We just don't like to see tons and tons of others that could have been correctly entered before. So that's our super quick overview of activity one. Are there any questions about the milkweed and blooming plant surveys? I will move on, but keep uh, throwing them in the chat if you want, if you come up with any. I wanna point out a couple FAQs that often uh, come up. What if my site doesn't have milkweed? Totally fine. Monarchs can use your site if there's not milkweed on it. You might have nectar resources. There might be milkweed in the following year. Um, don't, unless you're super interested and you only want to monitor a site with milkweed, um, just don't, you don't have to move it because there's no milkweed. That's fine. Do I still record a flower even though I don't think a monarch will use it for nectar? The answer is yes. Um, we don't have a comprehensive list of what monarchs do or do not use for nectar resources. And so the best thing we can do is just record a complete list of all nectar plants we find on site. That would include forbs and shrubs. So if you're on your site and your rose or your blackberry are blooming, yes, record that. Um, from Camden Township, your transect spacing would not have been 65 meters. So I will have to check on that report for you and see if that's a typo um, or what was going on there. Thanks, thanks for plugging that in there. Okay. <laughs> and the last thing is just uh, something that often comes up is there might be an obstacle along your transect. A lot of times our, our grasslands have shrubs and stuff in them. And so what we, want you to do is keep your transect straight. Here's an example. I'm sampling transect. Okay, I walk along. Here's my subplot. Here's my transect. Oh, here's a bunch of shrubs in the middle. Um, I'm supposed to place my, my subplot here in the middle of the shrubs, but I can't physically get there. Don't make your transect be crooked. Don't like make a weird little wiggle around it. Instead, just walk to the other side of this uh, patch of shrubs and you start your, um, put your next subplot as soon as you can on the other side of the shrubs. Question one. Oh, if there's no milkweed on the site, you're, you can keep monitoring it. It's certainly not mandatory that you do have milkweed. Um, activity two. This is a brief overview. It's really flexible. There are a lot of different ways to conduct it. We recommend doing it weekly. That gives us a really nice picture because monarch reproduction does change pretty drastically throughout the season. Um, and it helps us better estimate larval survival the more frequently you do it. Um, but if you can't do it every week, that's fine. Do it at a frequency that works for you. If you don't have milkweed on your site, you would, you would stop doing it. So this is to, to Laura's um, question. If you're doing activity two, which is our egg and larvae survey, you're not gonna find eggs and larvae if there are no milkweed. So you do have the option on that box to say, um, I completed an activity two, there were zero milkweeds. That's my data for the year. Then <laughs> um, there are a lot of uh, ways to select which milkweed you're monitoring. Um, sometimes there's way too much milkweed to look at every single stem in your plot. So the key is just to be unbiased. And our training videos walk you through a couple options. Um, in a census survey, it's, it's pretty easy. You're gonna walk around your census area, look for, um, examine all your milkweed stems for eggs and larvae. But in a really big space, you might choose to monitor or look at the milkweed along your plant survey transects. 
Uh, that's frequently what we do, what our field technicians do while they're sampling um, the milkweed and blooming plants. They'll just stop and look at the milkweed along these transects for, and look at them for eggs and larvae. You could also um, start at one side of your, um, your plot, ran, select a random compass bearing or throw a pencil in the air and walk the way that it's pointing. Um, do that a couple of times. And when you feel like you've completed, like done a good, good job, covered a lot of area, then you can stop. We don't, there's not a specific um, length or, or uh, that you have to walk if you're doing this random method. Um, <clears throat> for activity two, I have a couple questions because I just want to stress that the important thing is to be unbiased. So as you're walking along these transects, you're just picking out the um, all the milkweed within a meter of that transect. And you're not saying, this one looks great. I see a caterpillar on it. I want to monitor it. That one's too small. I'm going to ignore it. So we want to make sure that we're being unbiased when we look at them. So here's a little example. Um, after doing activity two a few times, Mary only ever finds monarchs on the milkweed that are shaded by a big oak tree. She decides then to monitor only the milkweed in the shade for the rest of the season. Do you think that's okay, unbiased, or is it not okay? Is that a little biased? No, it's biased. Yeah, that's pretty biased. So we're missing uh, something is going on maybe in that unshaded, the sunny area uh, that we might we might miss some activity. Um, another example is that Ken notices a few milkweed outside of his plot boundaries and decides to monitor those. He includes them on his IMMP activity two data sheet because they're very close to his plot, but they're not in it. Um, is that okay or not okay? Some more not okay. So yeah, thanks for thinking these through. These are these are real life examples that you know, it's good to just see um, how we can be a, a, as unbiased as possible. And my last example here, Janet has heard that monarchs prefer to lay their eggs on a certain milkweed species. So she makes sure to monitor all the milkweed of that species in her plot, and then just picks out a subset of the other species. Is that okay? Is that unbiased? Or is that not okay? Is that a little too biased? <laughs> Yeah, we're seeing some bias here. So we don't want to miss out on something just because we have preconceived notions about it. Um, any questions about activity two before a quick a run through of activity three? All right, we'll have more time for questions too if, uh, if they come up. Um, activity three is the adult monarch survey. It takes about 30 minutes. In general, you're walking at the perimeter of your plot looking for monarchs within five meters of you. Training video will walk you through more detail. Um, just a heads up, you're probably all aware, but not all orange monarchs are butterfly, or excuse me, not all orange butterflies are monarchs. So just be familiar with what you might see in your area. You might have some fritillaries, you might have queen butterflies, maybe viceroys. Do a little refresher. We have some training videos online also. It's best to do it a couple times a year. We recommend every other week if you can, um, but just thinking you know, logically about it, if I only do one 30 minute survey in an entire year, um, not maybe capturing the full representation of monarch use on my plot. So it's good, good to try to get out a couple times a year. So, super quick overview of activity three. Um, I want to end here with a uh, last little workshop live example cart, um, and then we'll, we'll close up. But in our portal, there are data entry and data summaries. So to enter data, um, I'm going to switch back over to our portal and just give a little example. So once you log in, this yellow banner, all right, we've already registered our sites. Manage sites is if you need to like add a contributor, maybe I want to have my friend Shelly also monitor my site. We can actually share sites. 
um, enter data. Here's what we have. Kitty Todd was an example, site four for 2022. That's how you're going to start your data entry, picking my site name, picking the year I want to enter data for. You'll see here that all our activities are grayed out. So it forces you to do that site description first. You have to create a site description. I clicked on it. I'm going to green button, add a new entry. Just real quick here, add all the minimal information. Everything, what we were APGS protected grassland. Let's say it's private. This was a conservation site. We did it for pollinators. Um, this was conservation by an NGO. The Nature Conservancy owns the Kitty Todd Nature Preserve. Um, data sharing level. So they said, I want to mask our data to the monarch block, that 10 by 10 kilometer level. We had a standard rectangle. We'll put in some fake coordinates here. And our bearing, our um, rectangle faced north. So our bearing is zero degrees. When we walked our first transect, we turned right to complete our rectangle. The adjacent land use, it was covered, surrounded by a lot more grassland. Some optional stuff, um, if I want to measure the slope, I can choose to measure the slope, add some notes, tell if there were disturbances, maybe it was flooded or recently burned, I could check yes and pick out those disturbances. I'll leave it at no for now. Fire ants um, in the southern US is where the fire ants are. Um, so I'm going to say not assessed. They're not in northern Ohio. Didn't look for them. We have some grass cover. We have some forb cover. Optionally, you can record your dominant forbs. We had a little bit of shrubs and we had no trees. Um, the guidebook actually defines shrub and tree for you based on size. So check that out if you have questions. Water features, there weren't any like wetlands or rivers or ditches. There was a little bit of bare ground. We did not look for invasive species in our plot at this point. So whew, we made it through our site description. And then we turn to data entry. And now everything else is live. So if I did in activity three, I'll click on that and enter my activity three data. So you can practice this on your own using the same login credentials. Maybe you actually registered a fake site under here today. You can practice entering any data there as well. So we'll send, we'll resend this um, information in the follow-up email. Feel free to use it. Um, you can view your data at any time. Obviously just log in, click that enter data button and click on any of these activities. So you can see you know, what you had recorded last time you were there. You can edit your data for up to about a year. We cut it off in the early calendar year um, just so that we can like finalize it and share it with researchers, but you'll get email alerts for that. Save your data sheets. Um, we will send reminders via the IMMP listserv about proofing. Um, we try to proof some subset of the data. So we appreciate if you can scan your data sheets and send them to us or even snail mail them to us. So that responsibility falls on us, but we appreciate if you can send us those data sheets. Um, in terms of, for the question, do you want data entered as soon as it is taken? Um, I'd say it's okay to enter it at the end of the season. Um, we don't do our proofing until the end of the season. And we generally finalize everything early in the calendar year. So. Um, we'll send a request that data entry usually be done by the end of October, if possible. We have a view results page that is forthcoming. So on this nice gold bar for you, there's a button that says view results. If you click on it, it'll say under construction. But eventually, um, this later this uh, field season, 
we will have like a nice table with stuff like your averages across site visits. So what was my average monarch density on milkweed stems? Uh, what was my average floral uh, nectar plant frequency? Stuff like that will be available soon. If you ever want your raw data, uh, we're happy to share that with you too. So if you want some like big Excel version of all the data you entered, just um, let us know and we can pull that from the back end. So for the data entry access and reporting questions, um, any, any questions on that? Mission Monarch. Okay, great. So we've got someone from Canada. And there is, yeah, we don't, I don't think we have Monarch blocks assigned for Canada. I will look into that, but you're right. Mission Monarch um, has its own monitoring program that is, I think they're developing something that's aligned with, so all the data are, are compatible with the IMMP. Um, but I appreciate that input. And I, I'll follow up with you. Um, I have to check with my colleague who's in closer touch with Mission Monarch. Is there an end of the year report or analysis? Um, there has been for, except for I think last year, we, we um, got caught up in some additional <clears throat> data quality control stuff, but we do try to send a report every fall on um, the, at least the participation. And then we'll send some, some really basic information about the sites that were surveyed. Right. We've got a wrap up slide here. So a few little tidbits and this will all come at you in our follow up email too. But uh, we highly recommend you sign up for the IMMP list serve. I'll send a link. Um, that's where we share any updates to the IMMP. That's where you would get that um, annual report like Lauren, you were just asking about. Um, you'll get reminders to email us your data sheets, all that stuff. It's not, it's not a ton of emails, probably six to eight emails a year. Um, we also share when people uh, publish results that are um, using IMMP data. You can get the data sheets from the IMMP website. We'll send that link as well. So you can download them and print them yourself. Supplies are available from the MJV store. So we'll send that link. You can buy a whole IMMP kit. It'll have a huge transect tape, um, the plant sampling frames, the clipboard, the uh, hand lens. Um, but you can also, you don't always need all that, or maybe you have some. And so you can totally get it on your own if you want. Share references of publications using the data. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I will send the references for the papers that have published with IMMP data. But I believe they're on our website somewhere. I'll try to dig that up as well. Just a reminder that you might need that data release from a, a landowner if you're not the landowner. Email us, yeah, email us your data sheets for proofing. So we'll send you those reminders on the list serve. If you can do a random survey, great, we would love it. We don't have nearly enough random sites surveyed out there um, and greatly appreciate that. It's also neat to have a comparison of what your cool like conservation management site looks like compared to something randomly selected on the landscape. And of course, stay in touch with us. We'd love to hear what people are doing, how they're using the data, if you have ideas on research projects, if you're interested in training or recruiting people, we've got ways to help with that. So we'll close out here just, to, just on time. And um, if anyone wants to hang around for additional questions, uh, Kristen and I will be here for a little bit. If there's other questions. Yeah, and, and thanks everyone for taking the time to join us. Um, this is really exciting to see so much participation. Yeah, thank you everyone so much. We're excited to see this much interest in it. Um, we've got tons of data rolling in already this year. 
And it's really exciting to see this program grow and it's all because of you. Hi, I have some questions. Um, so I got trained uh, with a coworker. I work for WVU Extension Service, West Virginia University mm -hmm. Extension Service with the 4-H program. So I, I got trained um, in June of 2019 and we were thinking about how to use this as an opportunity in our summer 4-H camps to teach mm -hmm. youth about citizen science um, and actively engage them in a project. Um, but then the last two years we haven't had in-person camping experiences. So it's now trying to get back into figuring out how to operationalize this. Do you have other um, groups that use it with, with youth in that capacity, trying to show them citizen science and any strategies you might recommend um, as we go forward? <laughs> It's a short list that comes to my mind. I know of one um, organization in Wisconsin that has worked with uh, high school students. What age youth are you interested in? Well, the site that we have selected is at our state 4-H camp facility and we offer three state camps and it's middle school through college. So the one camp that we're kind of targeting for the summer are 14 to 21 year olds. Um, so anywhere in that age range. Okay, that's great, that's great. We, we tend to recommend it for high school and up, um, but there are certainly like the adult monarch survey is fun for any younger kid to do. Um, and then I also have had a small group in Texas. And so if you're, interested in connecting with them specifically, I can connect you. Um, they can speak better to how they handle like the onboarding and stuff. We have example trainings and workshop agendas, but we've, um, in my personal experience, we've targeted adults. Okay. Okay. Well, and, you know, trying to be unbiased, um, we selected a plot that we could have access to that are, is at our facility. It's, um, uh, it's pasture. I mean, there's cattle on it, not a lot, and they're going to be far enough away from our young people, you know, um, mm -hmm. which code, I, I wasn't sure if that's the agriculture code that speaks to like, or it's not, we're not growing mm -hmm. things. It, it is pasture. It is, but yeah. we have access to it for these young people. Um, but you know, one of the things that my coworker and I discussed was kind of going out and doing a lot of the survey work um, ahead of time so that we knew what to expect in terms of the flowering plants and some of the stuff in there. So while they're maybe getting immersed in doing um, that work, we could provide them already with a probably a, a die a really honed in sense of what plants, flowering plants are going to have. So they have a real mm -hmm. short um key and you know if we find something outside of that scope of course we go after figure out what it is but we should have a pretty solid um idea of what to expect in this plot that probably isn't ideal but it works for where we can take these young people <laughs> and and do the work um yeah. during their camp that sounds great and your your idea of like having a short list of plants for them to learn up front is very helpful um your site i the, I think it's going to be a UGS, the unconserved grassland. Okay. As Kristen was talking about, grassland is a super broad category in this particular program, uh, but it's just, um, and, and then you can actually list what is grazed there um, for, for it being a grazed okay. land slash pasture. And I've got to find out some additional information. Um, the section that we plan to monitor is adjacent to some other university's research plot. I don't know what they're researching there, but it's, it is fenced off and the cattle don't have access to it, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't know whether that would skew anything that we, but I need to find out. And the land manager honestly didn't know what they were just like, that's just some, that's mm -hmm. some university's research plot. <laughs> don't go there. I'm like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> As long as you know the boundaries up front. Okay. Well, thanks for that context, Jenny. Um, I will connect you with you um, via email one on one as well with some okay. additional info. I appreciate it. Thank you. Couple people hanging on. Were there any other questions that came to mind? I don't see anything in the chat. All righty. Yeah. 
Well, thank you everybody for um, sticking around through the Q&A and I wish you luck on your IMP surveys and definitely shoot us any questions that come up as you go through the process. Yep. All right, thank you. Have a good day.